Welcome to Spiritual Awakening Radio. My name is James Bean. Today, why vegetarianism got edited out of early Christianity. And later on, we'll explore the Unity School of Christianity, a modern-day example of a group that was founded by vegetarians. But eventually, Unity School of Christianity edited out of their statement of faith the vegetarian sentences. They edited out the vegetarian teachings. Why vegetarianism and veganism? It's about adopting a non-violent, peaceful way of life based on compassion. Thou shalt not kill, applied to the area of diet. Heavenly spiritual values at the Eden paradise level. Values of the spirit of the kingdom of heaven, applied to this human existence. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'll share with you a couple of verses about vegetarianism from the poetry of St. Nam Dev, Vegetarian Sayings of Jesus. The vegetarianism adopted by the disciples, the apostles, the leaders of the Jerusalem community, sometimes referred to as the Ebionites or the Nazareans. I'll share with you a vegetarian verse from the Acts of Philip, a new translation. The original Acts of Philip contained some vegetarian references, but those were edited out of some Greek and Latin manuscripts. But some scholars retrieved the full edition of the Acts of Philip, a Greek manuscript from Mount Athos, and have given it a translation into English, a modern translation of the complete Acts of Philip. One of the greatest sources of evidence for vegetarianism is the Apostle Paul, as provided to us by the Apostle Paul in his New Testament letters or epistles, because in those he is arguing with vegetarian Christians. During the first century AD, Paul's letters date back to around 50 AD or so. Therefore, these vegetarian Christians did exist. We'll devote some time to the Gospel of Thomas and vegetarianism, and then delve into the editing out of the vegetarianism from the statement of faith of the Unity School of Christianity, and explore the general question of how surrounding pro-meat culture can pressure vegetarian movements into giving up their vegetarian ethics. The account of unity gives us a window, a glimpse into the mainstreaming process, the accommodation process. As the ranks swell with new converts, they bring their meat diets with them, and sooner or later, the vegetarian teachings get edited out. And the final segment today will be devoted to a reading from Keith Akers from his book Disciples on this same theme of accommodation, of Roman dietary occupation, how a culture will eventually cause vegetarian movements to give up their vegetarianism, to succumb to the popular diet of a culture. In the case of Christianity, succumbing to the diet of the Roman Empire. based on the current practices of the dairy industry around the world, that those saints of the past who advocated vegetarianism, perhaps a lacto-vegetarian diet where they would advocate abstaining from meat, fish and fowl, and eggs, but did allow dairy, would these days be adopting a fully vegan diet? giving up dairy, abstaining from all animal products. These days, many are making this transition. This is, in fact, the direction that the vegetarian movement is headed in. Vegetarianism is going vegan. Why vegetarianism? Why veganism? This is a poem from Darshan Singh's book, Pathway of Light. All living creatures seek a life of peace. 
So pass your days on this earth humanely. Even the heart that beats in an animal's breast knows sympathy, brims with love. So look on all living creatures with loving compassion. Bring to humanity's night the light of dawn. Pythagoras once said, as long as man continues to be the ruthless destroyer of living beings, he will never know health or peace. For as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, he who sows the seed of murder and pain cannot reap joy and love. A Pythagorean saying quoted by several ancient sources goes like this. A light, meatless diet sharpens one's spiritual perception, while a diet containing meat weighs the soul down. A passage to be found in the Golden Verses of Pythagoras, a textbook on Pythagorean teachings published by E.J. Brill Books. St. Basil the Great from early Christianity said something similar. The steam of meat meals darkens the spirit. One can hardly have virtue if one enjoys meat meals and feasts. In the earthly paradise or Eden, no one sacrificed animals and no one ate meat. Some verses from the poetry of Saint Namdev. While slashing the throat of an animal, the butcher unwittingly cuts his finger and shouts out, What pain, what pain, it's killing me. But in cutting others' throats, he does not hesitate. Like his own child, man cares for a young animal, then kills it with a knife to serve as meat. When the noose is around his own neck, he bemoans his fate. He does not remember inflicting mortal blows. Says Namdev, they are shameless creatures, yet call themselves devotees. How can they hope to realize the Lord? Vegetarian verses of Yeshua, Jesus. This is from the Aramaic manuscript, one of the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke, preserved in the Aramaic language. Be on guard so that your hearts do not become heavy with the eating of flesh and with the intoxication of wine and with the anxiety of the world. And this is from the Gospel of Matthew. Go and find out what is meant by the scripture that says, It is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. The Ebionite, or Hebrew Gospel, quotes Jesus as saying, I have come to abolish the sacrifices. According to the Gospel of the Ebionites, the Hebrew Christians, Jesus also rejected the Passover meal. Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? To which he replied, I have no desire to eat the flesh of this paschal lamb with you. Baptism instituted in place of sacrifices. But when the time began to draw near that what was wanting in the Mosaic institutions should be supplied as we have said, and as the prophet should appear to whom he had foretold that he should warn them by the mercy of God to cease from sacrificing, lest haply they might suppose that on the cessation of sacrifice there was no remission of sins for them, he instituted baptism by water amongst them in which they might be absolved from all their sins on the invocation of his name. 
and for the future following a perfect life, might abide in immortality, being purified not by the blood of beasts, but by the purification of the wisdom of God. The vegetarianism adopted by the disciples, the apostles, the leaders of the Ebionites, the Aramaic-speaking Christians, also called Nazareans. Peter said that he once was a fisherman, but adopted a diet of bread, olives, and pot herbs, or vegetables. Peter described himself and the other apostles as former fishermen that had long since adopted a simple vegetarian diet and itinerant lifestyle of poverty. Quote, Our way of life is being served with only bread and olives and sometimes vegetables. Unquote. A passage from the Syriac, Aramaic, Clementine recognitions and homilies. A kind of Ebionite book of Acts. They, the apostles, embraced and persevered in a strenuous and laborious life with fasting and abstinence from wine and meat. A quote from the church historian Eusebius in Proof of the Gospels. And happiness is found in the practice of virtue. Accordingly, the apostle Matthew partook of seeds and nuts, hard-shelled fruits and vegetables without flesh. A quote from the early church father of Alexandria, known as Clement. And this is from the Acts of Philip, which I just acquired recently, based on a new translation, a Greek manuscript from Mount Athos, which was recovered and translated into contemporary English in a book called The Acts of Philip, a new translation. For sanctity is the bridge for the souls of the righteous, and it abolishes the source of corruption. Therefore, raise yourself above the pollution of desire. Do not allow meat-eating and excessive drinking of wine to rule your members, lest your soul be cast in that mold." Unquote. The Acts of Philip, brand new translation. Hieronymus, an early church father, wrote, The consumption of animal flesh was unknown up until the Great Flood, but since the Great Flood we have had animal flesh stuffed into our mouths. Jesus the Christ, who appeared when the time was fulfilled, again joined the end to the beginning, so that we are now no longer allowed to eat animal flesh." Unquote. One of the greatest sources of evidence for vegetarianism in the original Jesus movement, the early church, is supplied to us by the Apostle Paul in his New Testament epistles or letters. Paul's letters date back to around 50 AD. In several of those, he's arguing with vegetarian Christians about eating meat, as well as eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. In other words, eating the meat of animals, the bodies of which had been used in religious ritual sacrifices in pagan temples. Paul thought it was okay eating meat, including meat used in these ritual sacrifices, whereas followers of the Jesus movement were not only opposed to eating meat used in animal sacrifices, but ate no meat at all, as they were vegetarians. The early followers of Jesus were vegetarians. Note that James, the brother of Jesus, was a vegetarian, as was the Aramaic community in Jerusalem that he led. This vegetarian apostle, by the name of James the Just, brother of the Lord, was the main leader of early Christianity, the head of the Jerusalem community that Paul was arguing with. James the Just, brother of Jesus, head apostle and next leader of the church. And he was vegetarian. And this is agreed upon by early church fathers, orthodox sources, August, you know, Augustine, St. Augustine. I mean, it's unanimous. Church historians, they all say James the Just was a vegetarian. James had a brother. Jesus, rather, had a brother. His name was James the Just. He's referred to by scholars and historians as James the Righteous or the 
teacher of righteousness. According to a wide variety of sources, James became Jesus' spiritual successor, the next leader of this group, referred to as the Hebrew Christians, or Ebionites. James was a vegetarian, quote-unquote, Professor Robert Eisenman. In his 1,000-page book all about James the Just, all we know, all of the passages in history about James the Just, James the Just, the key to unlocking the secrets of early Christianity and the Dead Sea Scrolls, a very big, fat, paperback book. In the Gospel of Thomas, saying 12, the students said to Yeshua, We know you will leave us. Who will be our leader? Yeshua said to them, Wherever you are, seek out Yaakov the Just, James the Just. For his sake, heaven and earth came into being. James, the brother of the Lord, lived on seeds and plants and touched neither meat nor wine. James, the brother of the Lord, was holy from his mother's womb, and he drank no wine nor strong drink, nor did he eat flesh. A quote from Hegesippus from the church history. So, and, and the previous quote was from the Gospel of Thomas, saying 12. James the Just will be the next leader after Jesus. And he's a vegetarian, and it's unanimously agreed to, attested to by all ancient sources. The Gospel of Thomas and Vegetarianism. Keith Akers has a book called Disciples. It is one of the best books ever written on early Christianity. It is very impressive. I can't say enough good things about the book Disciples by Keith Akers. Jesus said, Wretched is the body which depends on a body, and wretched is the soul which depends on these two. Gospel of Thomas, saying 87. Professor Stephen Davies comments on this passage. How does a body depend on a body? By eating it. A human body eats animal bodies for food. Therefore, a soul, we hear, is wretched if it depends on a carnivorous mode of life. Professor Stephen Davies also cites these sayings. When you ate dead things, you made them alive. When you arrive into light, what will you do? Gospel of Thomas, saying 11. Anyone living from the living one will not die. Gospel of Thomas, saying 111. The Apostle Thomas, that the Gospel of Thomas is attributed to, was a vegetarian. The Apostle Thomas, he continuously fasts and prays and abstaining from the eating of flesh and the drinking of wine. That's a quote from the Acts of Thomas, another book of Thomas, chapter 20. There are actually many different books of Thomas. There is the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. There is the Gospel of Thomas, a collection of the sayings of Jesus. There is Thomas the Spiritual Athlete, also sometimes translated as Thomas the Spiritual Contender. There is the Great Acts of Thomas, including the Hem of the Pearl. I highly recommend the Syriac version of the Acts of Thomas, which has all these beautiful hems in it. And it's a very spiritual book. It's also, uh, the Acts of Thomas is considered to be probably the most, uh, most popular apocryphal scripture, you know, studied by monks and studied in orthodoxy and as well as Manichaean Gnosticism. I mean, across the spectrum, everyone in Christianity historically, I mean, Nestorian Syrians, uh, you know, Syriac Christians of the East, everyone has enjoyed reading this great spiritual classic called the Acts of Thomas. And in it, it describes the Apostle Thomas as being a vegetarian. A modern-day example of vegetarianism 
in the Unity School of Christianity. This is based on an article called Pioneers. Mary Myrtle Page Fillmore, 1845, passed on in 1931, and Charles Fillmore, 1854, born in 1854, passed on in 1948. An article by Robert Elwood in the March 2016 edition of The Peaceable Table, the vegetarian journal for Quakers and other people of faith, the mutual uh, the, the Peaceable Table is intended for the mutual support, education, and inspiration of people of faith in the practice of compassionate love for our fellow animals and peaceful dining. This article was republished online in, in a website called vegetarianfriends.net. I want to share with you this article about the lost teachings of unity. The original founders of the Unity School of Christianity were advocating a vegetarian diet. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were co-founders of Unity, the Unity School of Christianity, the largest American denomination in the New Thought tradition. Some background, New Thought is a spiritual movement that rose in the late 19th century, influenced by transcendentalism and the growing optimism of that progressive period. It emphasized the power of positive affirmation to bring about healing and success. The Fillmores founded the Unity Church as the Unity School of Christianity in 1889, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore became vegetarian shortly after founding Unity, while at first they believed that what one ate was a matter of indifference so long as consciousness was right. They quickly realized that whether one's palate reflects love or violence has much to do with the inner life. Quote, I can say about flesh eating that the Spirit has shown me repeatedly that I could not refine my body and make it a harmonious instrument for the soul so long as I continue to fill it with the cells of dead animals." Unquote. The Unity Movement grew rapidly and as early as 1906 offered a vegetarian cafeteria in their Kansas City church and also a store, the Unity Pure Food Company, where one could get hard-to-find vegetarian products. In 1924, the cafeteria, dubbed the Unity Inn, was moved to a large headquarters complex where it ranked as one of the largest vegetarian cafes in the world, serving some 10,000 meals a week. The cafeteria boasted a large fountain, red tile floors, indoor trees, and French doors opening onto attractive terraces. On the second floor, a banquet room featured drapes, ornate chandeliers, and a formal stage. The cafeteria remains, but is no longer exclusively vegetarian. The Fillmore's three sons, Lowell, Waldo, and Royal, were active in unity and in vegetarianism. As early as 1906, Lowell wrote a vegetarian column in Unity magazine for a couple of years. And in 1911, Royal carried on a similar column under the pseudonym Veg until his early death in 1923. Despite his diet, most unfortunately... Royal suffered from obesity most of his life and died in his 30s from hypertension. His notable charisma, commitment, and his strong vegetarianism would have made him a natural successor to his father as leader of unity. As it was, Lowell, a capable administrator but perhaps less dynamic, assisted by Waldo as board chairman, presided over the church's remarkable post-war growth. Lowell had some tendency to play down Unity's distinctiveness and led the church into becoming mainstream Protestant, which was probably part of the reason for the unfortunate direction it took in the late 1930s. Nonetheless, at that time, the word was out in the days of the founders 
And during the horrors of the First World War, Charles wrote, quote, We need never look for universal peace on this earth until men stop killing animals for food. The lust for blood has permeated the race thought, and the destruction of life will continue to repeat its psychology the world round until men willingly observe the law in all phases of life thou shalt not kill the desire to demonstrate the love universal is lifting thousands out of every form of cruelty that selfishness has claimed is necessary to man's well-being therefore in the light of the truth that god is love and that jesus came to make his love manifest in the world we cannot believe it is his will for men to eat meat or to do anything else that would cause suffering to the innocent and helpless, unquote. A passage from Vegetarianism, published June 1915. Ironically, in 1939, on the eve of the Second and even more terrible World War, unity removed from its statement of faith this sentence. Quote, we believe that all life is sacred and that man should not kill or be a party to the killing of animals for food. Also that cruelty, war, and wanton destruction of human life will continue so long as men destroy animals. Unquote. That was edited out of their statement of faith. All the reasons for the turn against vegetarianism in the late 1930s are not clear but certainly it was part, in part a, a consequence of the death of Royal in 1923 and of Myrtle in 1931. Myrtle seems to have the real energy behind violence-free eating, and Charles's second wife, Cora, may have been less committed. Charles, who had relinquished leadership by then, himself began eating fish on occasion. It seems likely that a desire to fit better into the mainstream Protestant model and play down highly distinctive features in unity had a part of it as well. Myrtle, Charles, and Royal Fillmore fearlessly showed us the way towards its realization, and although subsequent leaders betrayed that commitment, many of their followers down to the present have remained vegetarian with the founders. As Charles said, life is the object of eating. We do not eat matter but life, unquote. To him and his, that meant the body was not a place for the entombment of corpses, but to receive life for the enhancement of life. It was Royal who added that our true task is to transform human tombs into temples of the living God, unquote. Food is the building material for that noble structure, but the dinner must permit the great harmonious spirit of truth to shape it into living substance, unquote. That's a fascinating article on the lost teachings of vegetarianism in unity, how they changed their statement of faith, editing out the vegetarian sentences. An article on Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, founders of the Unity School of Christianity, they were vegetarian, and this was published in Pioneers, Mary Myrtle Page Fillmore and Charles Fillmore by Robert Elwood in the March 2016 issue of The Peaceable Table a vegetarian journal for Quakers and other people of faith. The Peaceable Table is intended for the mutual support, education, and inspiration of people of faith in the practice of compassionate love for our fellow animals and peaceful dining. And as I mentioned earlier, it's republished online at vegetarianfriends.net. And that brings us to the subject of accommodation. The surrounding pro-meat culture pressures vegetarian movements into giving up their vegetarian ethics. The account of unity, the Unity School of Christianity, gives us a window 
a glimpse into the mainstreaming, the accommodation process. As the ranks swell with new converts, they bring their meat diets with them. And sooner or later, the vegetarian teachings get edited out. Dueling Gospels and Sutras, pro-meat and pro-veg, there are two traditions within Buddhism, pro-meat and vegetarian. Each has its own sutras or scriptures serving as proof texts. The same is true of Christianity, the original Jesus movement or Hebrew Christians versus latecomer Paul and others who were proselytizing citizens of the Roman Empire. For the followers of Paul, dropping the dietary requirement was a way to make more converts, to appeal to more Romans. The Gospel of the Hebrews and the Gospel of the Ebionites describe a vegetarian Jesus, vegetarian disciples, and a vegetarian John the Baptist. In Sikhism as well, we see the very same process of accommodation and eventual occupation. Guru Nanak's teachings versus some in later Orthodox Sikhism, long after the time of the 10th Sikh Guru. A Jewish mystical movement that's vegetarian that eventually reverts back to the kosher diet, a vegetarian Sufi order that over time loses its vegetarianism and its members a few short generations later come to adhere to the halal diet. This pattern has played out many times throughout human history. In all of these cases, the original spiritual movements were vegetarian, but later versions of these paths eventually accommodated the diet of the larger cultures around them, swelling their ranks. For most, living their busy lives and not interested in serious research or having no time for such research, not even wishing to learn about teachings that would challenge their current assumptions, this is all too complicated a history of Passover lambs eaten or not eaten, a Buddha that died from pork poisoning or never touched pork at all, locusts versus carob beans consumed by John the Baptist, fishes with or without loaves until well into second century gospel manuscripts. You know, all very complicated. The fishiness of Paulistic gospels, perhaps redacted by Marcion. Marcion as a pescatarian and nefarious editor and redactor of early Christian writings. Was it Marcion that added some fish references in some of the Gospels and in some of his edits, you know, and those never got undone, and so therefore slipped into uh, the permanent tradition of Gospel manuscripts? I do wonder about this and have my suspicions and may do a podcast on this at some point, the Marcion connection. It's such a complicated history, right? So most choose to remain with whatever diet and beliefs they've grown up with. Change is not easy for most people. So on the question of diet, they just see what they wish to see. Those on a spiritual quest seeking truth no matter what, however, are sometimes more flexible and willing to change their ways. Only the spiritual warrior will prevail against their own inherited beliefs. Only a compassionate heart will figure this out. In our final segment today, I return once again to a book by Keith Akers called Disciples, How Jewish Christianity Shaped Jesus and Shattered the Church. One of the best books on early Christianity, the John the Baptist group, the Essenes, Therapeutae, Mandaeans, you know, uh, the Jesus Sutra, the folks in the East that were also vegetarian, the, the Church of the Light in China. This book is so wonderful. Disciples by Keith Akers. We were just talking about accommodation, Roman dietary occupation, how spiritual movements can change over time. You can have a vegetarian Rumi founding a Sufi order that a few generations later, you know, is following the more mainstream 
Muslim halal diet. You can have a mystical Kabbalist movement saying, let's all get back to Genesis chapter 1 and be vegan, back to Eden, back to paradise. And yet eventually they go back to a more mainstream kosher sort of diet. You have Roman meat-eating Christians that have nothing whatsoever to do with the original Jesus movement and certainly were not willing to keep in print to translate the original Gospels of the Ebionites and the Hebrews. They certainly had no interest in doing that and left those writings behind to disappear from history. You find Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism being vegetarian, but later on some Sikhs eat meat. Same with Buddhism. You know, we find this playing out over and over again as uh, the teachings change when the founders disappear from the scene. This is how vegetarianism can be edited out of a religion, including early Christianity. And the more recent example of vegetarianism being edited out of the official teachings of the Unity School of Christianity provides a window into this process of accommodation, of mainstreaming, getting absorbed into a culture. Paul did this, participated in this. Keith Akers, this is a reading from Disciples by Keith Akers, a section titled, Paul's accommodation to the larger society. Keith Akers writes, Vegetarianism was an embarrassing issue in apostolic times, not just a creation of some later fanatical Ebionites. Paul specifically refers to those who do not eat meat or drink wine. So we have every reason to believe that there were radical vegetarians during the apostolic age. Paul likely understood that forbidding meat and wine was not going to go well with those in the upper class and that Christianity would spread if it could reach across class barriers to those who were well off in the ancient world. Keith Akers also writes, when the pagan emperor Constantine co-opted the church at the Council of Nicaea, The movement moderated its original radical ideals of pacifism in favor of accommodating the larger society. Suddenly, it was not only morally acceptable, but even praiseworthy to kill people in battle, provided, of course, that you were fighting on the right side. The church also found a way to accommodate commercial interests and become wealthy and worldly. Much of the monastic movement began as a protest against this compromise of what many thought was a sellout to the larger society. This is also what happened with vegetarianism in the case of two modern Christian groups, the Seventh-day Adventists, founded by Ellen White, and Unity School of Christianity, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. In both cases, the founders were ethical vegetarians, but in both cases, the adherence to vegetarianism was steadily weakened, and in the case of unity, seems to have almost completely disappeared. This tendency only rarely works to take groups in a more radical direction, but in the accommodationist direction, it is all too common, writes Keith Akers. Thank you for joining me today for Spiritual Awakening Radio. I love doing these occasional pro-veg, pro-vegan shows, adding some new research, some new material. Today we've covered why vegetarianism and veganism, you know, the reason, the spiritual and ethical reasons, you know, pertaining to living a violence-free, peaceful lifestyle conducive to meditation practice. We've covered vegetarian verses of Saint Namdev, some vegetarian sayings of Jesus, vegetarian sayings and information about the disciples, the original apostles who didn't stay fishermen for all eternity, but changed, you know, the rest of the story. 
the vegetarianism of James the Just, the Apostle Thomas and Peter, and so on. And I mentioned how the Apostle Paul, an opponent of early vegetarianism, nevertheless provides evidence for the existence of Christian vegetarians in the first century because he was arguing with them, therefore they existed. I shared with you a reading from Keith Akers on the vegetarian leaning sayings in the Gospel of Thomas. And then, of course, the article on the vegetarianism of the founders of Unity School of Christianity and how that gives us a window, a glimpse into this process of how a group can start off being vegetarian, like the Jesus movement or Sufism founded by Rumi or one of the other Sufi saints. And yet, de decades later, a few generations later, something different a different diet takes over. What's up with that? How does that happen? You know, and so today exploring that process, I think, is very helpful. If you'd like to say hello, my email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Thank you for joining me today. See you again next time for another edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. Mm -hmm.